I'm Claudia Bester. I'm the Director of Public Programs here at the Hammer Museum. And it's my great honor to welcome you to today's conversation with Amiri Baraka and Kelly Jones. Um, today's speakers are so multi-talented and creative and utterly brilliant that it's really hard to know how to describe them. A father and a daughter, both with huge influence in the art world and in American culture. And it's clear that in their family they've created a culture of fearless exploration and groundbreaking ideas. Dr. Kelly Jones is the curator of the Now Dig This exhibition. She's also a professor in the Department of Art History and Archaeology at Columbia University. Her research interests include African American and African diaspora artists, Latino and Latin American artists, and issues in contemporary art and museum theory. Dr. Jones has also worked as a curator for over two decades and has more than 25 major national and international exhibitions to her credit. She's organized shows for the Johannes Biennial and the Sao Paulo Biennial, and her writings have appeared in numerous exhibition catalogs and in the journals NKA, Art Forum, Flash Art, Atlantica, and Third Text, among others. Her newest book, I Minded, Living and Writing Contemporary Art, has been named one of the top art books for 2001 by Publishers Weekly. Her project, Taming the Freeway and Other Acts of Urban Hypnotism, African American Artists in Los Angeles in the 1960s and 1970s, is forthcoming from MIT Press. Um, Amiri Baraka was born Everett Leroy Jones in 1934 in Newark, New Jersey. After leaving Howard University and the Air Force, he moved to the Lower East Side of Manhattan in 1957 and co-edited the avant-garde literary magazine Eugen and founded Totem Press, which first published works by Allen Ginsberg, Jack Kerouac, and others. He published his first volume of poetry, prefaced to a 20-volume suicide note, in 1961. His book, Blues People, Negro Music in White America, was published in 1963 and is still regarded as the seminal work on Afro-American music and culture. He also edited The Moderns, an anthology of new writing in America, published in 1963. His reputation as a playwright was established with the production of Dutchman, which subsequently won an Obie Award for Best Off-Broadway Play and was made into a feature film. In 1965, Jones moved to Harlem, where he founded the Black Arts Repertory Theater School. Bartz lasted only one year, but had a lasting influence on the direction of Afro-American arts. Bartz sent five trucks a day into the Harlem community. Art show on one side, poetry reading on the other, music on another, drama on the other, where performances could be given in a changed location each day. Vacant lots, playgrounds, and housing projects published art that would be black as Bessie Smith, mass-based, revolutionary, and taken to the people, re reflecting the intensity of the entire black liberation movement. In 1966, when Bartz was dissolved, Baraka returned to Newark, his hometown, and set up with his wife, Amina Baraka, who was a founder of Newark's Loft, a local venue of contemporary art. Um, the Spirit House and the Spirit House Movers that brought drama, music, and poetry from across the country. And during this period, the Barakas founded the Committee for Unified Newark and the Congress of the African People. Both CIFUN and the Congress of African People led to the election of Kenneth Gibson as the first black mayor of a major northeastern city, spearheaded by the 1972 Gary Convention. In 1968, Baraka co-edited Black Fire, anthology of Afro-American writing with Larry Neal. Amiri and Amina Baraka edited The Music, Meditations of Jazz and Blues, and Confirmation, an anthology of African-American women, which won an American Book Award from the Before Columbus Foundation. The autobiography of Leroy Jones, Amiri Baraka, was published in 1984. His recent publications are Wise, 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 Funk Lore, Eulogies, Transfluency, Somebody Blew Up America and Other Poems, and that was published in 2002, and we will have that here today. Amiri Baraka and Amiri Baraka founded Kimako's Blues People, a multimedia art space from a small theater in their Newark home. Amiri founded the Jazz Poetry Ensemble Blue Arc, which is played at the Berlin Festival and throughout the U.S. His jazz opera, Money, with Swiss composer George Gruntz, was performed at George Wien's New York Jazz Festival in the early 90s. Primitive World, with music by David Murray, was performed at Sweet Basil, the New Yorican Cafe, and the Black Drama Festival in Winston-Salem. His Bumpy, a Bopera, with music by Max Roach, was performed in 1991 at Newark Symphony Hall and at San Diego Rep. Amiri founded the New Orchestra, a big band working to pr produce a living archive of this music. 
Uh, Mary Baraka's numerous literary honors include fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation and the National Endowment for the Arts, the Penn Faulkner Award, the Rockefeller Foundation Award for Drama, the Langston Hughes Award from City College of New York, and a Lifetime Achievement Awards from the Before Columbus Foundation. He was inducted into the American Academy of Arts and Lectures in 1995. In 1994, he retired as a professor of Africana Studies at the State University of New York in Stony Brook, and in 2002, he was named Poet Laureate of New Jersey and Newark Public Schools. So you can imagine what was happening in this family. <laughs> it's overwhelming. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Amiri Baraka and Kelly Jones. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all for coming out and uh, for coming to this program, for making this uh, one of the most exciting shows of Pacific Standard Time, of the Hammer Museum, and, um, and of my career, too. Uh, so exciting to just, you know, see people seeing it and enjoying it. And I just want to thank um, the artists for participating, for making these things, and uh, Annie Philbin, the director of The Hammer, for signing on all this time to this project. Of course, to The Hammer staff, Claudia Bester and her staff. Um, you can never do anything without all the people it takes to run something like this. Of course, to the security staff here who've kept everything safe. And also to you, again, to the visitors to the show, and. Um, passing on the word. I heard that Claudia already said the rumor is still rumor, but um, you heard it from this stage that uh, tell your friends in New York to get ready. <laughs> um, so what we're going to do is I'm going to read a little bit from today we're celebrating I Mind It. Oops, not the show, but um, you know, the show is part of my, my curatorial practice and my practice as a scholar and an intellectual. Um, but I also have this book out, I Minded, which is for sale, which is a, basically uh, my collected writings for the last 20 plus years. Who knew? I was really a prodigy when I started. Um, so um, it's great to celebrate this and, and see how that project, Now Dig This, fits in. Um, so what we're going to do is um, I'm going to read a little bit from the book and then my father is going to respond. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna get ready for that. You guys enjoy. <laughs> I'm gonna get ready, I'm gonna get ready for that part. Okay. So, uh, you know, I'm gonna read a little bit from the introduction, but the thing about this book is that it's mostly my writings, but it's in four sections. And um, so, uh, which are introduced by family members. And, I'll just read and, and you'll find out more, but that's just a little tidbit. On Tuesday, February 17, 2009, a drawing by Charles White, Move On Up a Little Higher from 1961, and a painting by Al Loving, Q27 from 1970, were sold by Swan Galleries in New York. Swan is known for its auctions of art by African Americans, as well as ephemera, documents, and material culture relating to black life. Prices were solid, only beginning to show the effects of the current economic downturn. For me, these two pieces signified something somewhat outside the strict register of monetary gain or notable historical fact. These were works of art made by my friends' parents, people I grew up with, hung out with, learned about life with. They signal the parameters of the community in which I was born, raised, and became an intellectual. In my world, art is not only a part of history, even a living history. Art, uh, art is, it is part of and makes community. It is part of and makes family. What I want to think about here is how art objects and the activities around their making and display in exhibitions, homes, studios, as well as their materiality in life are integral to forming relationships, connections, and kinship among sometimes diverse constituencies. How is art a connective force, a glue between people, 
creating the sense of community whole, but also of family and affiliation. Indeed, how does the circulation of art forms in public and private arenas create dialogues and sites of collectivity, personal and communal meaning, and how are these formations part of how we craft individual and larger social and political involvements? How do objects coalesce a public, create a life for artists and audiences, and a circle of friendships from the particular to the collective? In what ways does art become a catalyst for the invention of forms of and places for modes of familial and civic recognition and representation? The four-part structure of I Minded seeks to both illuminate and honor the family dialogues that have shaped my creative output over two decades as a writer and curator. While my writing is not poetry or plays, personal or social essays of my parents, Hetty Jones and Amiri Baraka, their love of both objects as well as the people who create art and the appreciation of culture generally was something I learned early on. My most constant fellow traveler in this world of culture, however, has been my multi-talented sister, Lisa Jones, a writer and filmmaker. We collaborated as sisters, friends, creative women, and feminists. We made the world in our own image and in the image of each other from birth. I have also been blessed to meet another cultural traveler in this lifetime, my husband, Guthrie P. Ramsey Jr., a music historian and piano player from Chicago. We started out with a writing collaboration and have been doing things together ever since. Um, so as you can see, you know, there are four parts, each part introduced by a family member. Um, so what I'm going to do is also just um, read from my father's part and then read a uh, selection. Uh, basically what I did is I gave, uh, I separated all this writing into four parts and I matched it up with a piece of their own writing. And then I gave it to them and I said, write something. <laughs> and, and they did. Um, so I'll read a little bit from the original piece that he gave me and then my own piece. Um, in his introductory essay for this value, volume, which he also calls I Minded, Amiri finds in his assignment the challenge of responding to issues of art in the post-nationalist era. He wades through the realities of gender as well as the ambivalent voice of conceptualism and a visual arena that resists didacticism, a singularity of voice, location, and purpose. Baraka dives into it also as an experiential maneuver and as always finds his place in a new world. So here's uh, the poem. Preface to a 20 volume suicide note. Uh, for Kelly Jones born dot, dot, dot. You can read it in the book. <laughs> you see, this is what happens. Somebody puts your birth date in the book, you'll never get away with that. Uh, lately, I've become accustomed to the way the ground opens up and envelops me each time I go out to walk the dog, or the broad edge silly music the wind makes when I run for a bus. Things have come to that. And now each night I count the stars, and each night I get the same number. And when they will not come to be counted, I count the holes they leave. Nobody sings anymore. And then last night, I tiptoed up to my daughter's room and heard her talking to someone. And when I opened the door, there was no one there, only she on her knees, peeking into her own clasped hands. And the piece I'm going to read from of my work is called Tracy Rose Post-Apartheid Playground, um, which I wrote in about um, 2005. And it's about um, South African artist Tracy Rose. If African photographers of the mid-20th century used the framing devices of the modern portrait and portrait studio as ways to construct visual narratives counter to those of the body as ethnographic icon, Tracy Rose has a similar relationship to video and to a certain extent performance. In Span 2, Rose reenacts the scopic regimes of the colony. 
She places her live body on view in a nod to the display of non-Western peoples in parks, zoos, museums, and royal courts, the playgrounds of European power, a practice dating back to the 15th century. As with Fusco, uh, Coco Fusco and Guillermo Gomez Pena, it is the willful agency that the artists bring to this form, along with their intent of ensnaring viewers in conscious acts of voyeurism that reverses the disempowering results that such actions have had in the past. But it is perhaps with video that such reversals are more recognizable and clear cut, if only because of our familiarity with such contemporary ways of seeing. In Unga title from 1996, viewers look down on Rose from above. It is not the bird's eye view taken from nature that art history so admires, but one from a surveillance camera. Excuse me. Similarly, the video piece TKO of 2000 provides a murky recording of Rose boxing a heavy bag. Both cameras and audio equipment are embedded within the punching bag, resulting in a picture that is grainy and filled with wild motion. The coarse, out-of-focus self-image has much in common with earlier feminist experiments, as Jan Avikos has keenly observed. Rose attack, Rose's attack of her inanimate opponent, done gloveless, gloveless and in the nude, builds to a breathy and screaming orgasmic climax. In both Ungetitled and TKO, the culture of surveillance points to a scopic desire. Indeed, these works in their conflation of yearning and visuality point back to the ethnographic object. At the same time, they reference the larger photographic archive, whether it be passbook pictures and other scientific or government imagery, bourgeois studio photography, or the photojournalism of the struggle against apartheid. The next piece that I actually want to read is by uh, my partner, my husband, Guthrie Ramsey, who was here um, last month uh, doing a dialogue with uh, Jason Moran. He's a musicologist. Um, and so I just want to read a little bit from his section as well, and then my response. Um, and as Guthrie Ramsey points out in his piece, opening this section, which is the fourth section of the book, my dad has the first section, my husband has a fourth section. <laughs> um, uh, and his piece is called Them, Their Eyes on Connections and the Visual. The lessons and models of art's knowledge have circulated easily among us um, as thought information, almost as family gossip. Of course, there is meaning in art outside of its life in the social world, knowledge that is made there, then available to us. Artist thought and artist history, sometimes the only reliable idea or evidence. The truth telling of arts making offers intellectual formations, ones that can, among other things, give us models of community. So this is uh, from Guthrie's original essay, Free Jazz and the Price of black musical abstraction, uh, which he actually, I commissioned him to write it for uh, my exhibition, Energy Experimentation, which I'll read from uh, afterwards. And, and this is also from um, 2006. On the formal level, free jazz comprised a number of sweeping experiments in sound organization that broke with the past. Because the music was more collectively improvised than either swing or bebop, the division of labor between soloist and accompaniment was often obscured. Each competed for the listener's attention because the music did not include a single emotional focal point, as in the case with, say, a pop singer backed by an orchestra, or even a bebop soloist center stage in the soundscape of a virtuoso, virtuoso trio. The New Thing's introduction of unconventional timbral approaches uh, pushed the envelope of what was expected in African-American music in general and jazz specifically. Popular song form, harmonic patterns were shunned in favor of open structures that denied listeners familiar landmarks and placed new demands on musicians. Two other significant breaks with past styles could also be felt in tonality in rhythm. Exploitation of the tonal system marked bebop as singular, 
the flatted fifth together with abundant ninth, eleventh, and thirteenth scale degrees made it harmonically rich modernism. Free jazz took this tendency and pushed it further out, almost completely liberating the genre from the restrictions of functional harmony. Finally, free jazz tended to move through time unevenly, undermining the sense of swing that perhaps represented jazz's most distinctive feature. Did free jazz, this radical experiment in sound, merely reflect the politically charged moment, or did it fuel it? Both. Evidence suggests, however, that because both sides of the equation, the musical and the social, were eclectic and diverse, drawing one-to-one -one homologies between the art and the times can be imprecise at best. Yet we can say this much. The political commitments of music musicians such as Archie Shepp and writers such as Amiri Baraka made the connections unavoidable. At the same time, we must always think about agency. Artists, no matter how political, are rarely motivated by a singular idea. Rather, they are usually responding to a variety of factors. The forces of the culture industry and the search for an individual, immediately recognizable voice within a set field of musical parameters, um, i.e. the formal qualities of free jazz, have, for example, always provided inspiration for creativity. Qualifications aside, the free jazz movement represents the most insistent consummation of social, cultural, and identity politics in jazz's history. There was an undeniable cross-fertilization of performance rhetoric. During the 1960s, Amiri Baraka's recitation style was heavily influenced by Albert Eiler's cultivated saxophone yelps. Charles Mingus and Sun Ra both experimented with poetry, and Archie Shepp was both a playwright and a poet. Music was a central preoccupation as the poets were often accompanied by jazz and R&B. The mutual influence among black artists of all stripes could also be seen in their similar attempts to control the modes of production of their work. Coltrane, for example, spearheaded efforts to start a record label and booking agency, and Baraka founded the Black Arts Repertory Theater School, sponsored concerts by prominent free jazz artists, and claimed that the cultural politics of identity should be central to jazz criticism. Such efforts demonstrated how these artists formed an unprecedented community of social and cultural activism. Um, so that was my husband's piece, Guthrie Ramsey. And now I'll read from, the last thing I'm gonna read is from my essay, um, called To the Max, Energy and Experimentation. New approaches to painting requir required new types of implements. Jack Whitten and Ed Clark were among those who developed different ways of applying paint to the canvas ground. Their inventiveness was not just in the workings of the flat surface, but in the methods and tools used to intercede in it. These interventions were also about process, where the actions constituting the creation of the work are made left visible. As Witten noted, the painting is more about the journey than the destination. Although an admirer of abstract expressionism in color field painting, Jack Witten considered his own works as a further development, field of, fields of painted matter that he related to the sheets of sound created by jazz musicians and the active surfaces of photography and process. As he explained, and this is a very long quote from Jack Whitten, but I love it. Um, I had a conversation with John Coltrane in 1965 at the Club Coronet in Brooklyn. He was playing with Eric Dolphy, and for about two weeks straight, I was going out there every night to hear him. Coltrane told me how he equated his sound to sheets the sound you hear in his music comes at you in waves. When they say training in, it's about the sound coming in waves. He catches it when it comes by, and he'll grab at as much of it as he needs or can grasp. I think that, in plastic terms, translating from sound, I was sensing sheets, waves of light, a sheet of light passing. That's how I was seeing light. That's why I refer to these paintings as energy fields. I often thought of them as two poles that create a magnetic field in which light is trapped. That's the energy.
your money. Don't be smart. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Your turn. Your turn. Well, you know, I think that, first of all, I would like to uh, congratulate Kelly on the show. I hope you all have seen that. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, I, you know, it's, it's, it's very interesting for me because I know the kind of uh, insights I can, you know, sort of uh, identify those insights. But what I see that's important to me is that people like, say, Charles White, uh, for me, were like the great uh, signposts of our era. That is, when we finally understood who Charles White was, because it's very difficult to understand art in America, because America's not about art. So to finally, when you do understand what art is, and say, oh, that's art, uh, it's, a, it's a kind of revelation. But like Kelly, from the beginning, that, that whole question about uh, preface to a 20 volume suicide, note, how long ago that poem is, and how naive I was about uh, the world to a certain extent. But the, but the question is, when you, when you say, and then I saw my daughter peeking into her own closed hands, that idea of, was it prayer? Or was it something that she discovered? See, that's, that's the question, first of all. Is this is something that I didn't know about? You know, uh, and so that, that, that's the, the kind of uh, the echo you do certain things, but then what do they mean? You know, uh, and certainly if you stretch that out, what do they mean 50 years later? You know, I, well, whatever years later. <laughs> 20 years later. Five years later. <laughs> but but, it's, but, it's, but it's, it's very impressive because it means that that Kelly not only can see, she can think, you see. And for our children, that's always important that we, we discover that. They can think, and they can think independently of you and not make obvious mistakes, you know. No, I mean, the obvious mistake would be to grow up in America figuring that America was what it says it is. <laughs> see, that would be an obvious mistake. Anybody could tell you that. Even immigrant, white immigrants could tell you that in the 1920s. It, it ain't what they say it is, you know. <laughs> but then to, to pick through that. Now, the question of, of Kelly and Lisa, that's, I think that's, to me, part of the, the really uh, interesting part of that book, what they give each other, you know, what, what uh, sisters who've been raised around art and who know art as a living thing, not as like a commodity or something you use to decorate ugly stuff. But, <laughs> but I mean, as a living thing that people give their lives to create. You know, that you, you, <laughs> you give your life to create. Like somebody said they were going to be a poet. I said, oh, you want to be poor. That's what you... <laughs> but to know people who do that and who dedicate their lives to creating art. That's, a, that's an incredible idea, if you think about it. That, uh, so the differences that we have is that I grew up with people, with peop I grew up with people like Charles White, you know, that kind of completely figurative, but really quite marvelous kind of craftsmanship. You know, then when I went to the village, we were steeped in abstract expressionism, which is something we didn't see there, actually, you know. But that's what was happening. You know, we used to go to the Cedar Tavern, there'd be Franz Klein over here and the Kooning over there and crazy guy to spread the paint around. <laughs> oh my God. Jackson Pollock. Jackson yeah, Pollock over there. Always <laughs> forget his name. Forget his name. And I grew up to, to accept that as a norm. You see, painting 1950 in America, 1960, that was the norm, abstract expressionism, until uh, pop art came in. 
which we despised. I mean, we, you know, meaning the young poets and artists in our particular world, you know. It's, it's what makes me so uh, disappointed when I go to Ireland for the first time and looking to find out what Ireland is and they have a, a, a museum full of Andy Warhol. I mean, <laughs> just tells you the terrible things communication can do. But coming out of that abstract expressionist thing and then going through the black nationalist period and trying to rehook up with those great people like Charles Wright and stuff like that, you know. And to know people like Mel Edwards uh, and his wife, who's a great poet, Jane Cortez. Uh, and again, it's to turn back on people who give their lives making art. And you can see that all those people are serious. That's the first, one thing you can see about that show. All those people are serious, whether you like that or not, whatever it is. They're very serious. And another thing, I, I came to appreciate somebody like Saar, Betty Saar, who I'd never appreciated before. And to look at David Hammonds, who I knew, you know, personally, when he was hooked up with the whole black nationalist, black arts thing. And to know that when he left out of that, that what he was doing is still very significant and very important. I mean, see, it's to, to follow people's lives that even though they're not doing exactly what they were doing, when you knew them, they haven't lost their mind. <laughs> they're just doing something else. You see, that's, that's important to, to track that. Um, the, the question, and I'm just skipping around because uh, I, I like to, uh, I like to do that. <laughs> But I think that, that, you know, like Mel Edwards, who I think is a great artist, really, that, that cotton piece hanging down there. What's, what's hip about that is that for you to look at this gross, heavy thing, and for him to get that in his mind, it got something to do with cotton. You know what I mean? To, to translate that, the weight to the weight of a social activity, like picking cotton. If you can look at that thing and think of picking cotton. Because he's talking about what? The weight of it, the weight of that activity on the slaves, the weight of that activity on, on the black people. Uh, I thought the Charles White thing was incredible, the black pope. I think that was, that was probably, when did that was that painted? Uh, like 73 or so. Was it 73? <laughs> he never made it, did he, the, the black pope? <laughs> <laughs> But I thought that was very hip. The, the, the. But people like I didn't know, like Purifoy, people really impressive. Uh, like I said, Saar to be really, really impressed with her work again. again. And uh, the irony of being in the hammer, you know, as, as a Marxist, as a, as a communist, a dirty communist, <laughs> is to, uh, to know Arm and Hammer, you know, Arm and Hammer. <laughs> and to know that Arm and Hammer was the first of these uh, big capitalist corporations to actually visit Russia and to talk to Lenin about getting that oil. You see, that's a very interesting kind of connection. <laughs> no, but I mean, the guy's smart enough didn't open a museum that would have my daughter showing it. <laughs> <laughs> how things relate, you know. <laughs> but uh, talking about abstraction again, is, is to, 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 because, see, one thing I learned from who was that? Bertolt Breck, who said that when uh, the people banned, say, art, like uh, my man uh, from Mexico came up there with Lenin's picture in it. Was Diego Rivera. Diego Rivera, and you know, he, Rockefeller said, you can't have Lenin sitting up in the, the museum, you know what I mean? But then the, 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 the kind of profundity of that was once the people that run the world found out that abstraction was safer, as Breck said, I'd rather have, you know, just colors thrown up there than to see the dead worker on the ground with the blood pumping out of his chest. Because one of those things, you have to take sides. See, so, so it's, it's a profound kind of thing.
does how do you how do you actually make something speak to the world? You know, that's what I'm I'm saying. So, but we know there are songs that don't have any titles, and you know a sad song from a happy song by the way it sounds. Some songs make you think of this, some songs make you say that. So that's the burden on abstraction. How do you say specifically what the world is? You know, how do you tell us who lives on this planet? You can go in some museums and you don't see any indication of the species that lives on this planet. You see colors, <laughs> but you don't really see the inhabitants, you know. So I, I think that's, that's, that's the kind of a thing that then, how do you find out what she's looking at in her hands? Is it, what is it? What kind of idea is that? You know, is it something that you can hold up and say, this is this? Or is it a feeling? Or is it a presence? You know. Uh, so those are my, my first kind of, uh, the thing about uh, Kelly and Lisa that's important is how they riff off each other. You know, she keeps calling her, sister keeps calling her uh, Jimi Hendrix. Right, in the piece, yeah. This is, the, you know, the hair when she was <laughs> young. I guess you were in your Jimi Hendrix period then, you know. Yeah. Uh, and Lisa, who's, who's a very good writer, I guess, when she comes out with her next work, uh, they vibe together like that. You know what I mean? I can, I, can, I can feel that. I can really feel that. But the show is impressive to me because it shows that she did see something. You know, she really dug something else other than what I had said. You know, that is, I always say, never settle for the given. That is, this is this. And that's that. You always have to say, well, what is that that you have mentioned? Or what is beyond that? That is, always go past the given. So I, that's what I see as this show, an expansion of what obvious, well, maybe not obvious to everybody, but obvious to, let's say, conscious people, people who think. Because it's very difficult to, to find people who really <laughs> I don't want to sound like a snob, but it's just a friend of mine said once that, that you know, experience is not the best teacher. It's just the most painful. You know? <laughs> so if you've gone through American life and get to be middle aged and you find it's very difficult to find people who can actually think. Because if there are people who actually think, it wouldn't be like this. You wouldn't see, you wouldn't see those, those Republicans, at that zoo of Republicans <laughs> working out. <laughs> what can we expect? <laughs> so, I mean, uh, and, and even an abstract expressionist like Ed Clark, I don't know if you call him expressionist, but I'm sorry. We went to Cuba together, 1960. We went to Cuba. We talked to Fidel Castro and Che Guevara in 1960. You know, and he paints still as abstractly as ever, but it doesn't mean he doesn't understand what's happening in the world. He's just expressing it the way he wants to express it. You see, so that's, that's one thing that I have learned uh, over the years, and I think that Kelly has had uh, a, a certainly been an agent of that, of extending your understanding of what relevance is. You know, what are you talking about? Because finally, whatever art you create, that's what it's about. What are you talking about? You know, what do you mean? You know, so that's, that's the, always going to be, the, to me, the bottom line of any art. What are you talking about? What do you think? You know. And if it doesn't answer those questions for me, then it's very difficult to, you know, to, to get close to it. You know. Well, since you've mentioned Lisa, I am going to read just from her piece. Um, another reason, maybe my own. Uh, 
crafty ways, but I put these other people in, my family, because all of their books are still in print. And I said, well, look, if their books are in print for 40 years, <clears throat> maybe it'll help my book stay in print. Maybe people will be interested in what I have to say. 40 years. Um, and my sister has a book called um, Bulletproof Diva, Tales, and Race, Tales of Race, Sex, and Hair. And um, that has been in print since 1994. You can get it. And we are, as my dad just said, eagerly awaiting her next book. But until then, you can read her piece in here called uh, Excuse Me While I Kiss This Guy and then, tie and then Fly and Touch Down, which is her new writing. But what I'm going to read from is um, her piece that I love from her collection, Bulletproof Diva, called uh, How I Invented Multiculturalism. It was easier than you think. <laughs> First I arrived, fatter than an AMP chicken, just another black child in New York City born to a Jewish woman and a Negro man. Before race became my passion and my battle cry, the only thing I wanted in life was to be joined at the hip with my older sister. At the wee age of three, I followed her to the Church of All Nations School on the Lower East Side, for many years, I thought the entire world was a band of Latin, black, and Chinese children dancing around the maypole and singing, Que Bonita Bandera. <laughs> <laughs> and the few Ukrainians who served us lunch. Go Lady Gaga. No, she didn't say that, I did. Picked up my first curse word, maricon, from Jesus. <laughs> Born in the Dominican Republic, which was an island he showed me just across the river from our playground on Avenue D. <laughs> 20 years later, I moved there, but someone had changed the name to Brooklyn. <laughs> Endured my first Tony home permanent at age six to have an afro like Angela Davis. This continued for four years. Then thanks to chemical overload or natural progression, my hair napped up enough to make a fro on its own. <laughs> Ate potato kugel and broiled chicken with Aunt Fanny, the only Jewish relative who didn't disown my mother for marrying a black man. 80-year-old Aunt Fanny stayed in Flatbush through, through the Caribbean migration and was known to have made only one comment about her niece's interracial marriage. How do you wash that hair? <laughs> she said, leaning over her grandnieces still in grade school and their enormous globes of nappiness. Metamorphosed in the late 60s at age seven as a nationalist poet appeared in the Poetry Review in praise of black women on stage at the Negro Ensemble Company Theater, wearing 17 braids and reading in the style of the last poets, fried chicken and collard greens grandma. My grandmother had me recite this masterpiece for her friends, the social workers and other silver-haired bells of black Newark whenever we came across the Hudson to visit. Name my cat Huey Newton. <laughs> Name my dog Ho Chi Minh. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's Lisa Jones. I mean, I'm just the, the scholarly kind of nerdy one. Um, but, you know, these other people write for, for real people. I just write history, you know. So she, she you know, everything I want to say, I take pages and pages, and she can say it in, like, three pages. And I'm like, wow. And it's funny. You guys are laughing, right? Just like, not laughing at what I write. So anyway, so, um, yes, we have had that relationship. Uh, you know, through. but I think that, that that kind of humor is really what crackles in art, no matter who it is. You always have somebody that can lay out something that, you know, some of those uh, Betty Sarr boxes are like out to lunch. Uh, or the <laughs> Black Pope, who I think has not been inaugurated yet. But <laughs> I mean, it's, 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 it's great art, but at the, at the core of it is kind of like a, this bubbling kind of humor that means you understand the contradictions in the world. 
You know, and you don't have to lay them out one, this, two, three, four, five, just soup. You know, and that to me has always been a, a, a part of a great art that you can actually um, describe the world with a stroke. You know, just, uh, and, and that's important. And then these artists here are impressive. I mean, I, I think they're very impressive. The whole show, I think, is. Very impressive, uh, and I want to congratulate you on that. But it's it, 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 to put that diversity, the strength of the show is the diversity of it. But at the same time, uh, uh, the kind of consistent high note of of understanding. You know, you know what I'm saying. Understanding the world. What does that What does that mean? Understanding. You know, the people in the Caribbean say overstanding. You know, it's the same thing, you know. Do you understand it? Do you understand it? Do you kabish, you know? Uh, that's very important. It's very important. And um, how did you collect all this stuff? <laughs> um, well, some of it, because I had been finishing this other book, right? I knew I had seen it, and whenever there was a show, I would run and go see it. And so when they asked me to put the show together, I knew the pieces in my mind, you know, oh, and I yeah. said, uh, okay, I know where these are right away. But then we, you know, took a while to come and see different collections um, here in L.A. and um, to see, you know, go to, say, you know, some things like, for instance, there's one untitled piece by Noah Purfoy in the show that I'd always seen in a black and white reproduction. And, but it's at the Whitney Museum. So myself and my wonderful assistant, Naima Keith, uh, went to the Whitney and we had them bring it out of the storage. And I hadn't known the color of it. And the color is like this kind of ochre kind of color. I'd never kn known the color of the piece. So, and you know, people say, well, it's, it's great to you know, have the, I mean, people protested to get works in these collections and they should be in the collections. The only thing is, sometimes these pieces don't get seen for 30 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so yeah. uh, even if you know where they are, doesn't mean that they see the light of day, yeah, yeah. you know. But I can guarantee you that when some of these pieces go back to their home institutions, they'll be coming out because that has happened with another show that I did where I took some things out and then all of a sudden, People were putting them yeah, up. Yeah. Oh, yes. Hmm. You know, and also what you're saying is important that a lot, a lot of artists, once they get a certain kind of ID, like they did this, you know, then that's all you'll see, that kind of thing. You know, it's like Hammonds. Hammonds used to be stomped down black nationalists back in the 60s, the black arts movement. Uh, because we had a specific thing that we were trying to do. You know, I mean, that, that was not just, uh, that was actually, we thought, to, to try to specifically teach people, black people, the importance of art. So after Malcolm was murdered, we left the village, went to Harlem, and began to go around the streets with art. We took one truck with paintings, one truck with poetry, one truck with music, one truck with poetry, and every night we would go to a different place. That was specifically to do that, you know. Uh, but now you could see that Hammonds, once I knew that he wasn't, you know, on that particular note, I automatically assumed that he was doing something less important. See, but that's not true. That's not true. I mean, the work that he did is still very profound and very important work. But it's just that it, it, it wasn't me to be, what's that word that you, when you're trying to actually instruct specifically, when you're trying to teach specifically? Do you know what I, the word is? Knock him in the head. No, that's not it. <laughs> didactic. <laughs> didactic, that's it. Did, there's a didacticism in the black arts movement. You know, why, do we, why are we taking that art and putting it on street corners? You see what I mean? Uh, why were we taking music like Albert Eiler and put them in the, in the, in, a, in a playground? You know, it's to it was to break out of the 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 box 
a formal art display, music display, and to try to reach the people who we thought would never, under any circumstances, you know. So that a lot of things that people define, like people would define Sun Ra, for instance, oh, that's some way out stuff, that's some way out stuff. When we took that to the streets, people thought it was dance music. <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't know it was supposed to be deep. <laughs> they knew that, you know, it had a beat. <laughs> So I think that's one thing we have to always think about, about art, that we have to try to always extend, extend the reach, you know, because art is a powerful thing. And somebody will see a piece like one of the things and say, oh, my God, I didn't know the world had that kind of thinking in it. Like the first time I heard bebop, I thought of stuff I'd never thought of before. I don't know what it was. <laughs> but I knew that I had never thought those thoughts before. The first time I heard Theolonius Monk, that was like weird. What is that? But that's what art is supposed to do. It's supposed to unlock you, you know, to, to make the world more available to you in a way that, it, that it's not. And I think that anytime we put a, any kind of uh, limitation on what kind of art, that's a mistake. See, that's a mistake. The question is, well, what are you saying? You know, what do you mean? That's just the important things, not what kind of art is it? You know what I'm saying? It's just, that's the, those, those are the boxes that we have to, to get out of, you know. I mean, there's even some pop art I like. I don't know what it is right away. <laughs> Joe Overstreet. <laughs> that one. <laughs> No, but what, is it, what do you mean? What do you mean? What are you saying? That's, those are always the, 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 the most impressive parts of art. I was trying to see some other folks that I uh, really uh, like. But the whole show to me is, is uh, very impressive, very uh, impressive. And I hope that enough people came to see it. They tell me it was 1,000 people here yesterday. Great God. Now that's, that, now, that's a real stroke, you know, <laughs> to, to be able to do that, you know. Um, but anyway, it, it, the thing is, what is important to you, Kelly Jones, in terms of talking about art? What is important to you? What do you want to say? You know, what do you mean? You know, that, those, those are still the, mo the, the, the important questions, you know. So a lot of people get through the world without actually ever having to do that. And they're making a lot of money by not doing it. <laughs> 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 so what about that? What, do you, what, do you, what is your view of the function of art in this world? Me? <laughs> um... um. Well, I think for me, art is about, art tells, it, tells us about our time. People make uh, things that, they reflect the time they live in. So that's the way I read it. As an art historian, you know, that's why I kind of uh, deinstitutionalized myself in a way from the museum, even though people keep bringing me back to do these shows. Uh, but to, I, I'm really interested in how art reflects history. Uh, you know, why did David Hammonds move from, you know, making these uh, body prints which were more didactic uh, to using grease and hair and uh, paper bags, right? I mean, I'm really interested in how people use these materials of their time or video to really think about their time, you know. Well, he did that because he was broke, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yes. Part of the function of art is to make it. No, that's true. <laughs> no, that's really true. It's important. But that, that's true, to reflect, to reflect your time, yeah. Yeah, specifically. But then you see you're given certain handicaps, and you still have those handicaps. You know, for instance, uh, I would actually like to understand what the world was through the slave's eyes. I would actually like to see what America was when them dudes first came up that boat. What, what did it look like? What was it? 
Now, the myth says they thought they was going to be brought up here to be eaten uh, by wizards and ghosts. So were you, were you eaten? Not exactly. But that, that question of art as a register of, 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 of the specific world that you live in, that's a good point. But the handicaps make that difficult sometimes, how to, how to be able to express that. You know, the, the, the ghetto, for instance, how do you express what is happening in those people's lives now? You know, uh, the whole thing about these Chicano immigrants, how, how, how do we get the whole impact of, of that here in America in this time, you know? And to look at television, for instance, you think nothing important is going on in the world. <laughs> you know, I mean, you, it's just nothing happening. It's, whatever is happening is that interesting. Anyway, you know, uh, when that instrument itself could actually be instructive for all of us, we could learn about the world in great leaps, you know, but it's not, it's not reflective. They're selling soap and stuff, but... <laughs> Not much else, you know. So that's a question for art. How do you break through the how do you break through the, the curtain that commercialism has put over the world so that you cannot understand it? How do you break through that to actually make people see and understand the real world? It's a heavy job, you know. It's a heavy job. And then you always have to watch out that you don't say too much. Or somebody will shoot you, you know. I mean it's, <laughs> it's true. <laughs> Say, why did he die? He said too much. <laughs> well, do you want to open it up for questions sure, now? You, we'll, yeah. we'll take some questions from the audience. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about that. <laughs> oh, see, I shouldn't have called on you, Cherise. Um, no, yes, it's in her book, actually. It's in her book, A Bulletproof Diva, Tales of Race, Sex, and Hair. Um, she is obsessed with hair in the book, too, for all of you who also are. <laughs> so pick it up if you like that. But uh, the, the group was called Rodeo Caledonia. And I was actually not a performer. I was, like, the manager. I was the producer. I would do what I do with shows. I, like... Everybody else can, can be out there. And it actually started because I did a show called In the Tropics in 1986 um, at the Longwood Art Center in the Bronx. And um, I think it was 86. It's in the book. Uh, I talk about it. But um, it was a space run by now artist Fred Wilson. He was still an artist, but he also had a day job then. And I was putting up this show, which looked at kind of the idea of the tropics as a place that... <coughs> Uh, you know, the idea of a place that was a place of tourism, but what was the, the world behind the tourists, right? So I had people from, uh, it was, a, of course, a multicultural international show. And uh, at that time, I commissioned my sister to do a play. I said, well, you should do something. Do something you're working on. Here's a, a venue. We have a little bit of money. And she did that, and that's, I think that's where the performance troupe was born. But so that was kind of my role, like getting people together. I never actually went on the stage in that way. I'm not, I'm not that person, you know. I'm the person that can help other people get there, but I, I'm, not the, um, I'm not the performer. Thank you. I just want to thank you both. I want to thank Amiri Baraka for taking the art uh, through New York, like you were saying, on the trucks. Because living out in L.A. in the 70s, we never had anything like that. And I want to thank you for your show because it makes me remember like in 1970 going to the Watts Towers and looking at some art like this and not really having anything to connect it to except what is this? And so I would say that uh, you're giving us something back, you know, stuff on the West Coast that we missed, you know, because everybody wasn't from an arts family. But, you know, we had the music. So I thank you for your bluesology and your jazzology. And I love it. And thank you. Okay. This person, thank you very much. Hi, I'm from um, London, um, UK, via Jamaica. Um, question, just picking up on um, your father's um, comment about um, commercialism. How do you view the world? In t in, uh, I suppose my question is, what if the world is commercial? So... 
the, the world today is commercial and um, in a sense it's actually a, pic it's, it's a kind of family, a question <coughs> relating to family in a sense. Um, and I'm thinking about the recent riots that happened in London and there's the whole question around you know, the looting and so on and what, what they were fighting for. And in a sense in, that picks up on the commercial point. And so young, this generation, their view and, and, and what they have to reconcile is with the commercial world. Um, and so in a sense, it, it's how fa and family members were, were at odds with that. So the older generation would, were at odds with their younger children, sort of doing this form of um, political kind of fighting and so on. Um, so I'm just wondering how your father it relates to perhaps your perception I don't know if I'm making much sense. Mm -hmm. Well, I know if the world is commercial, the poor should be able to sell their poverty, you know. <laughs> and if they could, then they wouldn't have to, you know, riot. You know, they could just say, I'm poor, give me $50,000. Uh, uh, speaking of, my youngest son is sitting in the audience. Uh, he's hiding back there. And then I have a son-in-law and a nephew hanging out in this audience to help us out, you know. <laughs> but that's what I think the world, the world is controlled by commercial interests, I would say that. But obviously, for most of us in the world, that's not sufficient. You know, that's just the reason to make it different, you know, to turn it around. I mean, you know, everything you do, for instance, India, you're talking about UK and India. You, <laughs> English stayed over there and transformed the whole of the continent you understand? So when they finally get kicked out, what? Then they make a movie called Gandhi, you know. <laughs> this, this, it, it, it's no shame in it at all, you know. It's just, we're going to exploit you. We're going to make money off you. And the only reason you're going to stop us is if you insist, you know. And what that insistence is, Fred Douglas said, it might be words. It might be blows. It might be both. You know, but uh, or this is said, without prog without struggle, there is no progress. You know, so that that's the end. So it is commerce, but the commercial is evil for most of the people in the world. I'd say, I'd say, you know. I have a couple of questions from my son, uh, Roger Mason, who is a new uh, playwright. He just closed a show called Onion Creek at uh, Son of Simile. He would like to know how he can um, go about uh, creating money and funds to, to help young artists, developing artists, uh, and new playwrights. That's one. Two, he wanted to know, could you please speak a little more about the slave's myth regarding coming to America? Specifically, the idea of coming off the boat to be eaten by wizards. Yeah. Was that uh, was that myth. I don't myth. know if it's been disproven, actually. <laughs> <laughs> was that myth their perspective or something told to them by slave traders? No. No, the, 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 the people in Africa had that concept about that, that they were evil wizards and they were taking them all off to the West to eat them. That's where the sun dies, the West. So that was their concept of that, that they were going somewhere where the sun died. And they, excuse me? What? How could they believe that when they were insane? When they were insane? No, chains. chains. He said, how can they can believe that when they were in chains? In Africa, not yet. You're <laughs> jumping ahead of yourself. <laughs> That's why they were in chains. They were being brought to eat, be eaten. You know, that was the point, you know. Uh, but the, the other thing the, about the, the, see, you're talking about the, the, the area of struggle. You're talking about money for arts and stuff? No. They spend a billion dollars to, 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 to blow up the world, but nothing for art. I, mean, I don't, I don't, that you have to see that yourself. You have to see that, that with some clarity. You understand? It's that. 
and and it takes struggle to do that. What whatever means you devise to do that, you know, you must find a way to struggle. If you say what you want to do is create money for artists, then you have to struggle to do that. There is no easy way to do that. They've got billions and billions and billions and billions of dollars here. You know, Duke Ellington said in that what is that that thing called Money Jungle? That was a great record of his with Charlie Money. He said, suppose you were in a place and there was money falling out of the sky, but you couldn't touch any of it. See? What are you in that place? <laughs> you know. <laughs> Hi. Um, I have a question for you, Amiri. Um, you speak about uh, not saying too much, like if you talk, say the truth too much, that you will be killed or you could be killed. Are you ever afraid of saying too much? <laughs> Because you, you said a lot since we've been here today. And I noticed once you said that part, your daughter said, okay, well, let's open up for questions. I'm like, maybe he's about to say too much. So do you, are you ever concerned about saying too much? Do you hold back? Not much. <laughs> but, you know, like, it's, 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 you have to be able to draw your own uh, bead on whatever it is you want to say at that specific time. I mean, uh, I mean, I've gotten a lot of trouble. Uh, you know, I mean, I'm the only person I know to get taken to jail about poetry. You know, uh, <laughs> but that, that's just a, ju a justification. You know, it's just that that's that's what your job is. That's what you. That's the gig. And if it has some difficulties, it's like uh, Obama. You say, well. You wanted that gig. <laughs> you know, my son uh, Raz is a councilman in Newark, and he has very difficulties, but you say, you wanted that gig. So, it, you know, you wanted that gig. You know, people don't understand it or they misunderstand it. You wanted that gig, so go do it. That's all, you know. It's the same thing with me. You, you wanted it, so do it. You know, whatever happens, you wanted it, so do it. You know, and, that, and that's, that's, uh, what's the name of that? David, who wrote that? The uh, Appeal. David Walker's Appeal. David Walker. I read that when I was a kid, you know, and it said that they banned that, they locked him up, and I thought, you think you could actually do that? You think you could actually create something that would make them want to lock you up? See, be careful what you wish for. You know. But uh, it's important what you choose to do, measure it, but do it. You know, that's all I can say. You know. Do I wish I were rich? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Every time I see some bills or so, which I <laughs> had some money. But that ain't what you wanted to do, see? I just wanted to say thank you for this conversation and for your insights. I'm, I'm particularly fascinated by the family dynamic. Um, you are a family united by art, by music, and the diversity that comes within that. Um, I'm curious in particular with your, um, your relationship, Kelly, with your sister. My sister is my worst enemy and my best friend. <laughs> and I'm curious about that symbiotic relationship that you talk about, um, where you know, you're know you behind the scenes and she's the one that you know, plays the music. But how does, how does that work? How does that creative process work? Did you guys have a conversation behind the curtain on what you would say? You know, did, you, did, you, did you have to prompt each other? Or is this all impromptu? <laughs> Well, we've been doing it for a few years, <laughs> just a few. Um, no, I, I mean, working with your family, I mean, that, I think that's what the book is about for me. Um, even though I have a PhD in art history, I love art history as a formal area of study, I first learned about art from my family. That's how I learned about art. And I thought, you know, I went to college, I just thought everybody knew artists. I thought everybody knew about art. Wrong. I went to an arts high school even, so even then it didn't dawn on me. It was, um, 
now called LaGuardia High School of Music and Art in, in New York. Um, and it was a public New York City high school, it still is, so you can imagine, it's a diverse high school. You never thought artists weren't all kinds of people, you know? It never dawned on you. Um, even then, when I started to read art history in high school, and I and kept saying, wow, there's no people of color. They're all ancient. <laughs> like, they're Mesoamericans, right? They're Egyptians. And after that, there's no people of color in art history, and I thought, that's weird. What are all these people doing here, <laughs> making art? And you know, and then I knew all these people. So it was, I really learned about art from my family first. So I never thought that, it was only later that I realized it was strange that it was, you know, kind of a monocultural study, as most, most studies are. And so I, I realized that was something that I could do. I didn't want to be an artist. I knew that. I knew I didn't want to be Poor, like my dad said, I was like, would I spend my last dime on paint? Never. <laughs> Shoes? Maybe. Um, you know, but, but I couldn't, I knew I couldn't do that. And I wanted to be a diplomat. And then I had a bad French teacher, so I said, hmm, maybe I'm not going to deal with French right now or whatever. And I went back to art. And then I said, oh, look, you know, there are a lot of artists, but there are not a lot of people there are more artists than there are people to tell their story or to help them get their stories out there. So that was just something that I found I was good at and I enjoyed. And um, I think my sister is just a brilliant writer. And, um, you know, of course, like your family, you know, every, you know, they might drive you crazy once in a while, but, you know, your job drives you crazy once in a while. You know what I mean? So um, that was just a role that, that I've... I've played. I'm the older sister, so I get to do that. I get to be nice to my little sister. You know what I mean? But um, to that sister, and of course, I just want to say I have many other sisters and brothers. My brother, he is here. And um, many of them are creative. Um, and you all might know my sister, Dominique uh, De Prima, who's on the radio, KJLH, yay, in LA, 4.30 a.m. to 6, so you should listen to her. I mean, she's creative in her way, too, as a, as a journalist. She's amazing. So, um, I don't know. It's just that I learned creativity from my family, and it was where I, I understood it first, and so um, I, I realized when I got older it was just a gift and that I would be able to share it with the rest of everybody else. So I think we are going to end. Thank you so much for coming. Um, we're going to have a book signing now. So if you want to get I Minded or the catalog or anything else, or if you already have your copy, we're going to take a few minutes and then we're going to be back for a signing. So thanks again. Thank you.